The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, doctors say this wonder drug could treat COVID and save 100,000 lives. This drug is super safe. It's safer than aspirin, Motrin, Tylenol. So why is the media trying to stop it? Basically fighting a propaganda war against the, the medical facts. Then, why did this man leave his family to live on the streets? I didn't just go to help the homeless. I wanted to be one. It was easier than living at home. Hey, I gotta pull away from you because you're not safe. What rescued this marriage? Everything in my life was over. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome, folks. We've got an exciting program today. You don't want to miss any of it. First off, we'll talk about what the president has done, taking executive action. President Trump has made an end run around Congress to get economic relief to Americans. Exactly what did he do? Was it legal? And will it work? George Thomas says more. Democrats claim the president's executive orders are ineffective and illegal, but the White House warns Speaker Pelosi and company risk angering the voters if they stand in the way. The big sticking point? A reduction in the federal boost to unemployment benefits to $300 each week, with an additional $100 coming from states. It's one-third less than the $600 unemployment boost they had been receiving. Democrats saying it doesn't do enough to relieve the economic pain being felt by millions. It doesn't do anything, and as the American people look at these executive orders, they'll see they don't come close to doing the job. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi questioning whether states can afford to contribute to each worker's check. What the president put forth was a complicated formula, which said that the states should put up 25% uh, of the money. States don't have the money to do that. They have expenses from the coronavirus. They have lost revenue uh, from shelter in place. The president's orders also call for measures to stop evictions, extend relief for student loan borrowers, and deferring the payroll tax on wages for workers making less than $100,000 a year. He even floated the idea of doing away with them permanently. If I'm victorious on November 3rd, I plan to forgive these taxes and make permanent cuts to the payroll tax. Democrats questioning the legality of the president's executive orders and even one Republican lawmaker, Senator Ben Sass of Nebraska, calling Trump's unilateral moves unconstitutional slop. Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin pushing back on the objections. If the Democrats want to challenge us in court and hold up unemployment benefits to those hardworking Americans that are out of a job because of COVID, they're going to have a lot of explaining to do. The president issued the orders after the two sides failed to reconcile the Democrats' $3.5 trillion relief plan with the GOP's $1 trillion offering. The four executive orders call for the federal government to spend up to $44 billion to help financially strapped Americans. But given the number of people unemployed so far, those funds will likely only last a few weeks. George Thomas, CBN News. People are hurting, and I tell you, the Democrats just continue uh, to shoot themselves in the foot. I mean, th this doesn't play well to the American people, and certainly the violence in the American streets isn't playing well. And the move by a Democrat uh, attorney, uh, district attorney, to defund, uh, I mean, to, to destroy uh, the American the National Rifle Association is just uh, one more thing that President Trump can be uh, gloating about. Well, in other news, the U.S. hit a big number in COVID-19 cases. So what's the good news? Ephraim Graham has more on that. Pat, while the overall number of cases is now more than 5 million, the number of new cases is trending downward. In a 14-day period ending Saturday, new cases dropped from 67,000 to just fewer than 54,000. And while the death rate is rising in 19 states, it appears to be stabilizing nationwide. Meanwhile, school districts are backtracking on plans to reopen. This Georgia high school, where students were pictured in a crowded hallway, is now holding remote classes Monday and Tuesday after close to a dozen students and staff tested positive. It was worse than I thought it would be because I thought more kids would be wearing masks and I thought social distancing would be attempted in the school, but it wasn't. 
Some 338,000 children have tested positive for the virus, nearly 100,000 of them in the last two weeks in July. Pat? Well, it was thought that children perhaps were not susceptible to that disease. Well, they are susceptible, but apparently it doesn't uh, devastate them as much as it does some of the other at-risk population. But they're getting it, and it was terrible. That uh, girl down in Georgia took a picture of showing all that crowd of students, and then they, they suspended her. What an outrageous thing to do. Well, they've lifted the suspension, but... We don't want to be like China that hit up the, I mean, you know, took the man out of his job who blew the whistle on the extent of COVID in China. Well, as the COVID-19 crisis continues, some Americans are facing mental health struggles. Among the most at risk are frontline medical workers and first responders. Now an organization that helps veterans is expanding its focus to help me medical personnel deal with the stress of nonstop pandemic. Mark Barton has that. So this, the red color that we're seeing here on the sides of the brain basically are, are telling you that this person has an overactive mind, maybe an aggressive uh, well, disorder they, of some sort. Well, they would have some emotional dysregulation, some aggressive type tendencies. When CBN News first interviewed clinical psychologist Dr. Timothy Barclay, we talked about his passion to keep veterans from harming themselves. What can I do to, you know, to really treat the, pa the population that I'm truly passionate about, but without giving these services away and going bankrupt in the process? It was like a light bulb that went off. Well, the only way to really do that effectively is through a nonprofit organization and to raise funds and to do what we do here in private practice, but to offer that to veterans. That led to the Collateral Damage Project, which helps vets battling post-traumatic stress, brain injury, and depression. And that's not all. Now, because of the coronavirus pandemic, Collateral Damage Project also is offering free treatment for frontline medical workers and first responders. Well, the treatment that we're offering for the first responders uh, and medical workers, um, it doesn't use all of the uh, research-based techniques and non-invasive brain stimulation and imaging that we do for the veterans with traumatic brain injury and things like that. Um, because mainly with first responders, we're going to be dealing with some stress, anxiety, acute stress, insomnia in, in, in the majority of cases. Barclay felt his organization needed to meet a great need. Work overload. Uh, added to the stress and anxiety of just being overworked, but then also the additional concerns of the, for their own health and their own safety, and not only for themselves, but what they're bringing home to their families. Collateral Damage Project is offering in-person therapy for Central Virginia residents and teletherapy for first responders and healthcare workers living outside the area. Barclay says each individual gets up to three free sessions. So we just wanted to offer some relief uh, to those frontline workers and give them a place to vent, uh, learn some self-care strategies because they just give and give and give. And sometimes at the neglect of their own personal well-being, which can open the floodgates to depression, anxiety and insomnia. We just want to give them an avenue to help offset that. An avenue to find peace in stressful times. Mark Martin, CBN News. North Carolina residents were shaken from their bed Sunday morning when a 5.1 magnitude earthquake struck an area, area near the Virginia border. It damaged roads and some homes, and it is the strongest quake to hit the area in more than 100 years, being felt as far south as Georgia. It was quite weird. We don't get uh, earthquakes in the eastern U.S. Um, we don't get earthquakes of this size more than every decade or so that there was the magnitude 5.8 in central Virginia. It damaged to the Washington Monument in D.C. And that was only in 2011. Several smaller quakes preceded that Sunday morning jolt and Pat, at least two aftershocks followed. Thanks. I, I was asking our staff to see if they could uh, find it if there's some kind of an earthquake fault like they have out there in the uh, San Andreas and also the uh, New Madrid, but apparently not. Uh, it's just the way it was. The Appalachians were built up, and this is 
just a little something kind of setting itself back the way it's supposed to be. So I think we shouldn't worry too so much. this isn't connected to the Ring of Fire like no, the California. No, no, the, the Ring of Fire, the North American plate, the Pacific plate uh, are bumping up against each other all the time and they're, they're moving. So, and the same thing, you know, that they have San Andreas as a clear fault line and the New Madrid is another fault line. There's one running under New York City, by the way, but uh, this one it was just, they say it's just had to do with the Appalachians getting formed and it's, yeah. it, we just waited a few hundred thousand years <laughs> for another one. So I don't think that's a big deal. But I tell you one thing, it is powerfully hot and Phoenix just set another record. Here's Ephraim with that story. Pat, as you said, Phoenix, Phoenix did just set another record. Residents naturally not celebrating this. Sunday marked the most days in a year with temperatures climbing to 110 degrees or higher. Some 34 days, but that record is not going to last long. Phoenix is expected to hit 112 degrees today and even higher temperatures later in the week. A heat wave is also headed for the south. The index will make it feel like 100 plus degrees over the next several days. I want to turn now to the disaster in Lebanon. Nearly one week after more than 200 people lost their lives in a massive explosion, the people of Lebanon are demanding a change in government, and they're calling on the world to help them do it. Here's Chris Mitchell with more from Jerusalem. Since last week's explosion seen around the world, thousands have marched to Beirut's Martyr Square to blame Lebanon's leaders for the disaster. People are enraged. They are enraged that so many politicians and public officials were aware that more than 2,700 tons of explosive material was just left in the port for years without any safety measures. Many clashing with the police. The battle lines are drawn as angry Lebanese protesters briefly took over some government buildings. Prime Minister Diab plans to call early elections, and several parliament ministers have resigned. We will not accept what happened yesterday unless it is a turning point in Lebanon's history. In a virtual conference Sunday, including the UN and United States, French President Emmanuel Macron told international leaders the future of Lebanon and the region is at stake. Yet sending help is difficult due to Lebanon's government leaders accused of corruption. President Michel Aoun ruled out an international investigation because he said it would delay justice. Many blame Hezbollah for the disaster, but its leader Hassan Nasrallah denied involvement. I'd like to confirm today, I declare and confirm a categorical, absolute, decisive, firm denial that we have anything in the site. There is no weapon storage. I don't buy this uh, with the, the story uh, uh, at all. That's because Middle East expert Dr. Mordecai Kadar says Beirut's port had become known as Iran's main arms supply route to Hezbollah. Every night, between 3 a.m. and 5 a.m., Hezbollah actually was kicking out all the officials and the policemen, everybody else, and uh, the gate was for itself to do whatever they like. Qadar says the calls for change in Lebanon's government could potentially have the biggest impact on Iran's master plan that has helped Hezbollah entrench itself into Lebanon for 40 years. Hopefully now the world will start looking at how Hezbollah took over this state and maybe the world will do something about this or tighten the grip over the Iranians, head of the octopus, in order to release states like Lebanon from this grip. One Beirut resident told CBN News they feel it's not so much a political battle, but a spiritual battle over the future of Lebanon. It's why they're asking the worldwide church to pray for their country. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Much prayer needed indeed. Pat? You know, ladies and gentlemen, whether you like it or not, along the way, you and I and all of us are faced with the choices. We can make a choice to go one way, or we can make a choice to go another. And then we have to bear the consequences of those choices. Years and years ago, we were dealing with Lebanon, and uh, the uh, representative of Lebanon of the United Nations was a famous man. Uh, he was a great statesman, honored throughout the world. And uh, we entertained him and got to know him and got to know their people. And they had an arrangement in Lebanon that the Christian uh, people had the presidency, the Muslims had the prime ministership, and 
they shared power, and the country was beautiful. It was a par Beirut was the Paris of the Middle East. Well, now here's the deal: the PLO came in and started tearing the country apart. So there was civil war, and uh, along the way, the Israelis fought down through Beaufort Castle, went into Lebanon, and uh, they took control of the army. And they, they were now in control of Lebanon, and they came to the Lebanese Christians and said, here we are, we're your friends, and you can have a free Lebanon if you ally with us. So what did the Christians in Lebanon do? They said, the money that we have comes from the Middle East, from the Muslim nations, and we feel that we do not wish to be identified with Israel. We will be identified with the Arab countries. Well, now we see a country totally torn apart. They made a decision. They picked the wrong course, and they've paid the price for it. But it's sad for us to see it, that beautiful, beautiful country that is spoken of so fondly in the Bible. And uh, the whole idea of Lebanon is those beautiful snow-covered mountains, the cedars of Lebanon. I mean, it's just a beautiful country. And they had the most beautiful um, situation at Beirut, the Paris, the Middle East. And that was a, a, a city where, I mean, if you were a shopper, you could get anything. They had all the latest fashions. They had jewelry. They had delicious food. They had beautiful hotels. They had everything. And it's all gone. All of it blown up. Desperate condition, desperate finances, and the country totally in chaos. You pay the price, ladies and gentlemen, for the decisions you make. So you need to be praying. You don't blame God for it. God, it wasn't his fault. They made a decision, and they paid the price for it. Terry. Well, still ahead, she grew up in a family held at gunpoint. He grew up with a raging alcoholic. Together, they formed the perfect storm. The question is, can their marriage be saved? And up next, the war on hydroxychloroquine. Why has this drug now become the first politically incorrect medicine? And why have the doctors who defend it been defamed? Find out after this. Folks, I've dealt in the Middle East for a long, long time, and the mosquitoes out there bite people and they get malaria. And, well, quinine has been the treatment for malaria for decades, perhaps centuries. And a drug called hydroxychloroquine has been around for 60 years and has been used safely for malaria, as I said, and lupus. And some doctors say that if you add it to with zinc, it becomes a real treatment for the prevention of COVID-19. Some others don't agree. Well, that's the way it's supposed to be in science. You, you put forth your uh, hypothesis, and other people can debate it, and then it's so-called peer-reviewed. But why are the advocates of hydroxychloroquine shouted down in the public square? Why are their, their uh, posts being censored on the uh, Twitter and other uh, platforms? What's really behind all the controversy? Dale Hurd has the story. It may be the first politically correct, you know, politically incorrect drug in American history. How did a drug known for decades as safe and effective suddenly become dangerous? Hydroxychloroquine is so safe that in several nations it's sold over the counter without a prescription. But the media has started treating hydroxychloroquine like a public health menace. And this pharmaceutical smear campaign began around the time this guy started talking it up. I'm taking it, hydroxychloroquine. Right now, yeah. A couple of weeks ago, I started taking it. 
because I think it's good. I've heard a lot of good stories. Then came all the news stories about how hydroxychloroquine is somehow risky to take or that it doesn't work against COVID-19. And when this group of physicians calling themselves America's frontline doctors held a press conference in Washington to educate about COVID-19 and tell the truth about hydroxychloroquine, they got the same treatment the media has been giving the drug. Video of their press conference accumulated over 17 million views during the eight hours it was hosted on Facebook. But when Donald Trump Jr. tweeted it, his Twitter account was restricted for sharing content that may pose a risk to people's health. Then all videos of America's frontline doctors were stripped from Facebook and YouTube and their website was taken down. An avalanche of negative stories began. The impact of COVID misinformation, how it's hurting the fight on the front lines. These experienced licensed physicians were called quacks, funded by dark money. And with USA Today reporting, the doctors don't know what they're talking about. So if you ask me if I expected that, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I, I don't know what to say to that. You know, I thought I lived in America. You had a bunch of doctors talking literally about science getting deplatformed. It's outrageous. The group spokesperson, Dr. Simone Gold, with over 31 years of experience in the medical field, says she was then let go by a hospital for what it called the embarrassing video. I'm a board certified emergency physician. We are pretty hard to come by, and suddenly they don't need me. I mean, it's ridiculous. And all this over a drug many doctors believe is safer than Tylenol or aspirin. It works. We've now shown it works, and we're still pouring hatred on this medicine. The safety and effectiveness of hydroxychloroquine is certainly debatable. So why can't it be debated on social media? Why has a drug long considered by many doctors to be safe become the first politically incorrect medicine. It's a political drug now, not a medical drug. Dr. Harvey Rich, a distinguished cancer epidemiologist and professor of public health at Yale, told Fox News the Ingram angle he believes hydroxychloroquine could save between 75,000 to 100,000 lives, but that it's up against corruption in the medical and pharmaceutical industries. We're basically fighting a propaganda war against the, the medical facts. I think initially the media just hated it because Trump liked it. You know, it fell into category orange man bad. But hydroxychloroquine could also stand in the way of huge profits. It only cost about $10 a dose. New treatments about to hit the market could cost in the thousands. The people who benefit from hydroxychloroquine being kept down fall into the following categories. Anyone who's a comp who has a business interest that competes with hydroxychloroquine and also Politicians and leaders who are invested in keeping Americans in fear. Dr. Anthony Fauci continues to say hydroxychloroquine doesn't work. The, the, the overwhelming prevailing clinical trials that have looked at the efficacy of hydroxychloroquine have indicated that it is not effective in coronavirus disease. But a recent Henry Ford Health System study of over 2,500 patients found that hydroxychloroquine worked. And there are far more studies showing hydroxychloroquine works than studies showing it doesn't. But it is primarily a prophylactic. Dr. Gold says it works best to prevent COVID or in the early stages of the disease. It's essentially a magic bullet, especially if you use it early. Rarely have I seen anything in medicine work so well. It's not working like a like a you know, like an antibiotic, you know, taking days. When it works, if you give it early, it works within 24 hours. It's really, really dramatic and it's really fast. But use of hydroxychloroquine is now limited in 44 states. And state medical boards are reportedly threatening doctors who prescribe it, even though the FDA says the decision should be between a doctor and patient. Whatever the reason for the political opposition to this drug, it could mean one less tool that might save a life. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Let's not politicize this. They've politicized AIDS. You can't talk about AIDS. You can't tell anybody they've got it. You, you can't uh, release uh, facts about it. There's just, it's a politically correct disease. And once the, uh, well, in that case, they, they don't want them, uh, the, anybody to know they've got it. Now it's a question of one that Trump likes. So let's not, let's not tout it, even if it works. You don't want to live in a country like this, do you? I, I think it's time 
we, we have a real look at our spiritual life and say, what kind of a nation do we want? Do we, do we want freedom of thought and expression? Or do we want to restrict our thought? Do we want to have political correctness running our lives? Well, it's getting pretty bad, but uh, we're here to tell you the truth. Well, let's just keep standing on the side of truth. And Jesus said, you will continue in my word. You will know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Terry. Coming up, a Monday round of your questions and honest answers. Cindy says, Pat, I always hear you say this is a nation of criminals because of the laws and the books. Don't you think laws are there to protect us? Stay tuned to hear what Pat will say to that. But first, her fantasy was a handsome prince in wranglers and boots. Her real life husband wound up homeless with hepatitis. So how did this couple mend their fractured fairy tale? Stay tuned to find out. This is Pat Robertson with an excerpt from my new book, I Have Walked with the Living God. I hope it will help you in your walk with God. Jesus found his disciples arguing as to who was the greatest. He made it clear that the greatest was the one who was the servant of all. True leaders are those who are humble and who feel that their calling is to serve their fellow workers, not to dominate them. Carolina was looking to be rescued. Philip was fleeing from abuse. And when they got together, their marriage imploded. How were they able to mend it after a blood-curdling scream? You're about to find out. My grandfather was an alcoholic, and he would start drinking every night around quitting time and inevitably pick a fight with somebody before dinner was over. It, escalated way beyond physical altercations. Frequently, there would be guns brought out in the picture. And there was many times that we were all held at gunpoint. My dad was a very hardworking, blue collar guy, and he would push and drive himself so hard. And then when he would come home, he would start to drink and get angry. And when he got angry, somebody always got hurt. When Philip and Darlena Fields first met in graduate school, they had no idea how similar their backgrounds were. Because of their unstable childhoods, both Philip and Darlena responded to the gospel when they heard it as young people. When I walked into this little country church for the first time in my life, I felt that safety. You know, there was something present in the atmosphere that wasn't present in my home, love. But then when they said, hey, this is, this is all about this man, Jesus, I was, was hooked. I got saved at an Assembly of God church camp at 17. And that is one time in my life that I was glad that my mom made me do something because I completely gave my heart to Jesus, all my hopes and dreams. And that was what changed the, the trajectory of my life. Philip and Darlena married. They went through premarital counseling, but the baggage from their childhoods quickly surfaced. I was looking for a handsome prince in Wranglers and Boots to come and rescue me. I didn't know what a, you know, what a fantasy that I'd conjured up in my mind. And when you grow up in brokenness and abuse, you fantasize of a rescuer. There was a combination of struggles. A lot of it was family influence. What, what she had was, you know, I'm gonna come at you and fight you. And what I had was, I don't wanna fight you. I hate conflict and I'm gonna run away. I kind of thought that my way was more godly than hers because I, I, I wasn't uh, exploding with anger and attacking. I was really triggered with Philip's disappointment in me. Once the disappointment set in, it triggered depression. The Fields grew their family and their ministry, but still had a lot of work to do on their marriage. Philip says he often escaped through alcohol and binge watching TV. Our real enemy was fear. You know, my 
My fear of conflict was my fear of being controlled. Her uh, fear of disconnection was, you know, expressed in anger. And so it's like, hey, don't pull away from me. And I'm like, hey, I got to pull away from you because you're not safe. At one point, Philip experienced a church split. His ministry crashed and he fell into a deep depression. He left Darlena and began living on the streets. That was me testing God. You know, I didn't just go to the streets to help the homeless. I wanted to be one because I felt that way inside. I felt like I'd blown it. I felt like I had failed. I felt like that everything in my life uh, was over. Philip came home after a week, but while he was on the streets, he contracted hepatitis. With Philip's health and their marriage in jeopardy, they heard about a deliverance ministry. So the program that we went to practiced corporate deliverance. And so I was in a, we were in a corporate deliverance setting. The person that was teaching touched on self-hatred. And when he said, we tell the spirit of self-hatred to go, something came out of my chest. It's such a force. And I let out this blood curdling scream that I couldn't imitate because it wasn't me. And after that day, my suicidal depression was gone. Philip had an encounter with the love of God that, that healed his soul and eventually healed his body of hepatitis. The Fields continued to seek more counseling and were able to rescue their marriage. Today, they have a ministry to couples that includes the physical and mental aspects of a relationship, as well as the spiritual. We didn't just need communication skills. We needed healing. That healing thing says, I want my heart changed. And that's a Jesus moment, right? And so we bring Jesus into the healing, and then we use the healing as a way to learn how to communicate better. It was when I set my family free from the fantasy that I was, I had them in prison too, it was when they were free to be who they were. It, it was like a revival hit our home, you know? When we crushed fantasy, we destroyed the fantasies that we had had for each other, our marriage, our ministry, and went after the real. And that's when we started having the marriage and the family and the ministry that we dreamed of that brought great fulfillment, contentment, and peace. You know, we grow up dreaming about what we want to be, dreaming about what our life will be like, kind of fantasizing about what would be success, what would be happiness, what would be the right partner for us in life. The Bible says that God creates us with intention and with purpose, that He has a plan for our lives. And you know, sometimes just like Philip and Darlena, with sincerity, we come to Christ at a certain point and we commit our lives we confess our sins, we invite Him in, but then we start asking Him to give us the dream that we created, when in fact the real path to happiness is figuring out what He created us for. And Philip said it, it goes right back to Jesus. You see, you can't do that for yourself. There's only one who can give you that wholeness, and it's the one who created you the one who created you with intention and purpose. The Bible says we're created in His image and likeness. And so He wants so much to fill our hearts with the dream He has for us. He wants so much to heal all of those things that Philip and Darlena talked about. You know, they're, they're all spirits. And in our lives, until we come to the place where we give everything to Him, where we literally surrender, lay down and die before him and say, all my plans are gone. I want you and everything you have for me. Those broken places in us leave doors that are open to spirits that come in, that want to destroy us. That's their purpose, that's their goal. Today, if you're struggling in your life with some of these things, whether it's in your marriage or in some other capacity, God has a plan and purpose for your life. 
Let Jesus come into those hidden places. Let him come into those broken places. Stop trying to look good on the outside, impress other people with who you are or how spiritual you are or how much you know scripturally. We all are in the same place that Philip and Darlena were. We are unhealed. We are unwell spiritually until we give it all to Jesus Christ. All of it, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and say, I want new marching orders. I want a new definition of who I am. I want a new relationship with you that supersedes everything else in my life. Will you pray with me right now? You may have already committed your life to Christ and been well-intentioned, but maybe you never gave him all of it. You can do it right now. You can have the same healed, fresh, intentional living beginning that this couple had. Let's pray together. Jesus, I know that I am a sinner and that I've done wrong, but beyond that, there are things in me that have been broken, things in me that have allowed to stack up over the years, feelings of resentment, bitterness, lack of understanding, just um, so many things. And I've, I've invited you to be the Lord of my life, but I've never really given you my life. I'm just giving it all to you today. I'm, I'm not giving you a few things. I am climbing up on the altar before you and saying, I'm done. I'm done. Will you touch my life? Will you teach me? Will you show me where I've allowed the enemy to come in and what his name is so I can call down that spirit? Will you, Holy Spirit, come into me and fill me with your peace and your presence and your power? I exchange everything that I am, everything that I have for all of you. Thank you. Thank you for your willingness to do that. Be resident in me now. Teach me how to live for you, how to walk with you. Breathe in me. Change the way that I think and see and feel and know so that I can reflect you, Jesus, and walk in the glory of who you created me to be. I pray all of this in your matchless name. Amen. If you have just prayed that prayer and you want to know how to walk with the Lord, a new day is for you. Pat's put it together just for you. It's free. It's filled with wonderful information about how do you grow in your relationship with Christ. And we'll send it to you when you call our toll-free number. We've also got a pamphlet on love and marriage. If you're struggling in your relationship like Philip and Darlena were, we'd love to send you this as well. It's all free. So is our toll-free number, 1-800-700-7000. Call now. Pat? Thanks, Terry. Still ahead, her husband kicked her out and left her with nothing, not even a credit card. So how did this woman earn more than $200,000 in only one year? Oh, I know you want to know her secret is coming up. Plus a question. Mary says, my son wants me to baptize him. Do I have that authority? Well, I'll have your questions and honest answers coming up. And welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN Newsbreak. A new study shows most Americans support the precautionary guidelines churches and houses of worship have taken to prevent the spread of COVID-19. According to a Pew Research Center survey, eight in 10 Americans say churches should follow the same rules about social distancing and large gatherings as any other business or organization. Among Christians in the U.S., three quarters say houses of worship should operate under those same conditions. Evangelical Protestants support giving churches more flexibility, though according to the study, a 62 percent majority say they do support restrictions. To provide guidance during the COVID-19 pandemic, CBN is inviting its Spanish-speaking audience in Latin America and around the world to join them on Facebook Live to pray through difficult situations. Vitadora host Omar Murillo is producing a new Facebook Live series. It's titled Pray with Omar and it airs multiple times each week. Viewers join together to share their prayer requests with Vitadora and to intercede for others. Now, the topics include overcoming fear and discouragement, 
finding the peace of God, strength for the weary, and faith through the pandemic storm. In addition, though, through on-the-ground partnerships, CBN is able to refer young people struggling with substance abuse and issues to rehab centers in various cities in Latin America. And you can learn more about what CBN is doing around the world by going to cbn.com slash international. Pat and Terry are back with more of today's 700 Club. It's coming up right after this. She was kicked out of her house by her mean husband. <laughs> but... Today, Rita runs her own multi-million dollar company, and she's seen a hundredfold increase since she started the business. But at one time, Rita had no job, no home, not even a credit card to her name. So how did she do it? Take a look. My husband walked in, he said he wanted a divorce, and he told me to get out of the house. It ripped my heart out. I had no means. I, I didn't have a credit card in my name. And since she'd worked for her husband, now Rita Bonarigo didn't have a job. Eventually I couldn't pay rent. That makes you, your like heart palpitations, it makes you feel like you're drowning. It's a nightmare. And you just feel like a loser. Like what happened? Rita reluctantly moved back to her childhood home where she could share basic expenses with her sister. Over 45, alone, competing in a world where youth matters in sales. It's a lonely feeling, and I cried out to God. Rita had become a Christian and started giving years before. I trusted God, I believed his word, and he said, test me. So as she got small jobs, she gave. If I earned $100, I gave 10 back to the Lord. I just knew that I was supposed to tithe, and so I tithed. One place she gave to was CBN. The 700 Club does so much good with the money they receive with Orphan's Promise, and then like where they go in and do the surgeries, like for the cleft palate surgeries. I sir cataract. I trust them with every dime I send them. She says it was this consistent giving that gave her faith to believe that things would change. I didn't know how. I was like scratching and clawing at this point and desperate. But I knew that somewhere God had a blessing for me. And as I continued to tithe, God was faithful. Eventually, he opened the door. Before long, Rita started landing jobs with top office supply sales firms. I remember my first year when he finally said, okay, the test is done. You've passed the test, and now here we go. I earned over 200,000 that year. From there, her income continued to grow. In my job, I always prayed for wisdom and discernment that God would be glorified. God started putting people, decision makers in my life that we just clicked. One big client even helped her open her own business. The increase in my company from when we first started, it's had to be at least a hundredfold, at least a hundredfold. I'm blessed to be a blessing. If I tithe, God can trust me. Rita's advice for anyone struggling like she once did, put God first and give. When you think you have no hope, that you are so desperate, trust God. When he says, I will open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings, you just cannot outgive God. What a testimony. I want to say to people, the thing about Rita was she expected a miracle. When that money is held by you, it's not going to do anything except maybe uh, you might get a 2 or 3% uh, uh, interest on your money. But when you give it to God, it's 30, 60, and 100 fold. And when it goes into his hand, and but Rita said, I knew God had a blessing. And so she learned the secret. And we thank the Lord for her and this testimony. And by the way, we want you to join the same expression Rita did. She's a 700 Club member, and then many, many, many fold over that. And you can do the same thing. 
And uh, I want to give you something when you're a 700 Club member. It's called, Do You Need a Miracle? Uh, Real Stories of God at Work Today. And I'll give this to you as our gift to you. And uh, it's 700, uh, 7,000, it's the 800 number, 1-800. And so you can count on me. You've got a you know, testimony. This is Dora who lives in Omaha, Nebraska. Mm. She says, do you need a miracle is awesome. We have watched it more than once and we get something different each time. We want to use them as gifts. That's a great idea. It sure thank is. you, well, she Thank says. you, Dora, mm-hmm. and thank you all. Okay. We time got for some, some questions. You ready? All right. all right. This is from Cindy, Pat, who says, I always hear you say this is a nation of criminals because of the laws and the books. Don't you think laws are there to protect us? Uh, uh, Cindy, uh, there are 300,000 laws on our books that have some kind of criminal sanction to We lost count at 300,000. But let me ask you this. Uh, If a young man in his house has five ounces of cocaine, just has it, do you think he should be put in prison for 10 years? Does that protect you? Well, the answer is not really. Well, what if somebody has, uh, he's robbed a convenience store and then the next time he takes a, a, a little bag of candy or something, he gets arrested and he has to go to jail for the rest of his life. Does that protect you? We have, there are so many things on our books that criminalizes normal conduct, normal conduct that people are doing, those laws do not protect a soul. Uh, Now, violent crime, that's a different matter. Somebody uh, beats somebody up, he goes in and and robs the store with a gun, by all means, put him in jail. But don't put him in jail because he went into a wetland and and, uh, planted some seed. And he goes to jail for 10 years for doing that. That doesn't help you, all right? This is Mary who says, my son wants me to baptize him. He says, I'm the best preacher he's ever heard. I am a born again Christian and attended Bible college, but I am not ordained. Do I have the authority to baptize him? Uh, There's nothing in the Bible that indicates you have to have some kind of ordination to baptize. Paul said, look, God sent me to preach the gospel. And I, yeah, I baptized a few people, but uh, you know, anybody can baptize in the name of Jesus. By all means, if your son wants to be baptized, go for it. This is Karen who says, Pat, the voting solution is to give us more days to cast our votes at the poll. So, social distancing is the goal, not a manual counting system. Your thoughts on this are important. Why are we even considering a manual system that will take months to get results and will have limited integrity? Uh, I don't know what manual system you're talking about or what other system. Um, uh, I don't think, uh, for example, in our area, they're not asking us to uh, do manual. You go into a polling place and you check off something. It goes into a machine and it counts. That, that's we've been doing that. That's no problem. But what is the problem is to get people who are, are not even on the rolls. Um, ballots are going out to people who are dead. And the, the, when you send out willy-nilly, uh, you know, uh, ballot forms to people who you're not even aware of, that's the danger. Not the fact that we won't want it manually counted. That's not, nobody's asking for manual counts of votes. Of course, they got to be voted, counted by machines. All right. This is Luana who says, when we get to heaven, do we still love people? My mom passed from this earth in April of 2019. When my father joins her in heaven, will they still love each other the same way they did as husband and wife on earth? Do we take that love with us when we go to heaven? Uh, Love never fails. These abide faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Of course, love will continue in heaven. But you won't be married like a husband and wife. You'll be like angels. And uh, if there was any kind of sexual relation between them, they will not be there anymore. But in terms of love, whether they be these gifts, they'll, they'll pass. But these abide, faith, hope, and love, of course. This is Jean who says, what is meant by the year of Jubilee? Well, the year of Jubilee was a year when gifts were canceled, and uh, it was a seven-year cycle, not a 50-year cycle. But the year of uh, Jubilee is it proclaimed liberty throughout the land. And during that time, slaves were set free, 
and the debts were canceled, and uh, people went back to their original homesteads. And that's what Jubilee is. We, we say this is the year when your debts are canceled every 50 years. Okay. Could use one of those, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> this is Elaine who says, Hi, Pat. In all my years of reading the Bible, I never realized what a treasure there is in Genesis 126. It reads, quote, Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. Pat, could you please tell me who the us is that God is referring to? Is he talking about himself and the angels? No, I, I think he's talking about himself and the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're three in one. And uh, uh, like us, I mean, what what he is? He's a he's a moral being. He's a spiritual being. He's a uh, he he understands things, and uh, he can create. So he's made us as creators. Human beings are made to create, and they're made to have fellowship with God. But he's talking about the Trinity there: the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And there you've got the, the Trinity. Let us make man in our image. Okay. Well, today's Power Minute is from Romans 15. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, tomorrow we've got our good friend Sean Hannity. He's going to talk about his new book, which is quite popular. And uh, you, you want to talk to Sean, he'll be here. And for Terry and all of us, thank you for being with us. God bless you. And we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.